So I want to say a few things about race. So um, there's a lot of things I want to say. Uh, first of all, I want to say this. I want to say that I recognize that there's uh, institutional racism, and I believe that that is a significant factor with what it is that we see today. I believe that the racism today is more covert than it is overt. It's not so much uh, segregated uh, conditions. Um, well, it is a segregated conditions, but it's not legally segregated. Uh, and it's not so much of the obvious racism, but it's more covert institutional racism, So, such as wealth. Uh, housing, access to jobs, education, health care, uh, land. Uh, when it comes to the important economic indicators, white folks are beating black folks. And black folks are also more, to, uh, more likely to be unemployed. Uh, there's a higher number of unemployed in the black community, which is, you know, a desperate situation. And there's a lack of jobs, lack of opportunity. So, um, you know, I recognize that. I'm also in favor of reparations. I think the only way in order to uh, stop, uh, uh, to, to start the healing, you know, to stop the racism and to start the healing to get by the initial uh, insult of slavery, you have to pay them. You have to put resources into the situation. And I don't think that it'll solve racism, but I think that it'll, it'll be a good foundation for them to springboard um, um, uh, you know, to say that it's to bring back more equality. So, you know, I'm for um, reparations, and I'm against racism. I'm against white supremacy. I'm against uh, bigots. I'm against, uh, you know, uh, really against white supremacists, cluxers, and confederates. Um, Something else too. The my I've I've had uh, I've struggled in my life and in my childhood I was raised up uh, as a child farmer. Okay, so I was a, a child of a farmer. Now some of my cousins were taught welding and some other like decent uh, skills that they could use in order to make money from uh, learn how to drive the tractor so they had some control and power. But essentially I was used for cheap labor just to do the dumb labor, to shut up and just not, like, know what was good for me. Just just do it, just because um, we're being told to do it. That's it. And so when Malcolm X speaks about, um, you know, when he speaks about the conditions of the African people, of the historical African people, when he says that the slaves were working from can't see in the morning to can't see at night, uh, they never had a day off, but on Sunday they're allowed to sit around and sing about when they die, they wouldn't be slaves no more when they died. I feel that. I know exactly what he's talking about. When he makes the distinction between the, the field Negro and a house Negro, I get that too. Field Negro says the conditions are bad, let's get out of here. But the, the house Negro is close to the master, and so they're saying, well, if we have it so good here. The master gives us all these nice clothes, and we eat the best food. Why would we ever want to leave? Harriet Tubman even said that it had more slaves knew that they were slaves, she could have rescued thousands more. I see the same thing happening here. Uh, my my mother didn't speak up against the atrocities. You know why would she leave? She has it so good there. So why would she go? Why would she you know leave such a, a good condition for herself? Um, so when Malcolm X speaks about slavery, I I feel that directly in my life. I experienced literally literal slavery out in the fields, tobacco patches, tomato patches, stripping and doing it for no wages, no pay at all. A lot of city kids, even orphanage people, they don't have to uh, become a slave and slave hours at a time. I was also a straight-A student, uh, played on the basketball team, academic team. I was very active, and I did a lot of things, but it didn't matter how obedient I was. The obedience never paid off or turned, uh, it was never flipped up to respect. Uh, I was supposed to have no thoughts of my own, no dignity. And so, so I understand a degree about slavery that I think no black person today understands. Uh, there's wage slavery today, and so there is still a hierarchy, uh, but in terms of literal slavery, just do a bunch of work for no pay whatsoever and being out in the fields, I, you know, there's, I, I don't know of many black folks ha who have picked cotton, you know, so um, I wasn't picking cotton, it was tobacco, uh, but the, the conditions are very similar. They're very similar. So when Malcolm X um, I, when he talks, he speaks to me. I hear Malcolm X directly. Actually, in fact, I think Malcolm X, my first father figure, my first main father figure, um, was Malcolm X. So, 
uh, just so I can get to all this, I uh, got some thoughts I wrote down here. The um, whiteness studies, basically what whiteness studies teaches is that you're supposed to, I'm supposed to, or any other uh, uh, Caucasian with pale complexion um, that's, you know, perceived as a white person, every person that benefits from whiteness needs to use that privilege in order to attack the institutions of whiteness. So if you're in a position to uh, make sure that somebody is not discriminated against and you need to enforce that position. So, and I understand that and I believe it. That, that's what Tim Wise says and I think Tim Wise has a lot of good things to say. Now he comes from middle class though. He has got a higher privilege than what uh, other people, me or homeless folks or working class whites have got to endure. But that doesn't mean that I don't have white privilege. It just means he's had a better privilege. Uh, he's, had, he's understood white privilege better. Uh, white, white privilege has helped his life out better. So some other ways, you take a back seat to conversations, you allow others to go for, first, and you also stand up to uh, racism. Now somebody else uh, that's important to mention here is Noel Ignatieff, and he wrote a thing called the point is not to interpret whiteness but to abolish it. So one part of whiteness studies is to uh, get white allies to fight against uh, racial oppression. But another part is to explain that whiteness is not a culture. Whiteness has nothing to do with culture and it's got everything to do with social position. It has nothing but a reflection of privilege and it exists for no other reason to defend it. The only reason why it is around is to say that white people are uh, above black people and so in order to, uh, the only reason to keep white around is in order to keep that uh, racial hierarchy, that racial totalitarian dictatorship, which has persisted over much of American history, especially Kentucky history. And Kentucky was known to secede after the Union. Okay, and also in 1910, Tennessee was the one that passed the one drop rule, if you're familiar with the one drop rule. So privilege, okay, the, now use that same argument with privilege. Uh, use whiteness in order to destroy whiteness. Uh, in order to destroy racial institutions. So 30,000 children in the world starve to death every day. So every time you put a, a piece of food in your mouth, every time you eat, you are you have the privilege of food. Um, I had told this one African gentleman that he had privilege of eating, and he was he was dismayed about it. He was real mad. So it's weird that he would be you know like kind of upset with me about you know yeah I got white privilege, but my struggle trumps my privilege. He didn't like my explanation for that. But when I told him that he had privilege because he ate, he was like, no, I don't. I don't have that kind of privilege. And he does have privilege. He's got if you eat and you have a benefit uh, that you have that other people don't have. That's what a privilege is. So using the same argument, um, uh, that means if you're got the privilege of food, then you should use the privilege of food just like you use the privilege of whiteness in order to smash the racist institution. So you should eat the food in order to use that food to help other people who don't have food. So you use the privilege that you have in order to give other people who don't have privileges, uh, you, you make it a, a more equitable situation. So just like uh, in my uh, uh, educational psychology class, most folks there have cars, they got vehicles. So if you have the privilege of a car, then you have, you know, that, that all factors in somehow. There's the interconnect, intersectionality of how all this, you know, all these influence of ideas, I think, connect in a very complicated way, and I'm not for sure. I think generalizing is, generally is a bad idea. You should, you know, specifically take a look at individuals, and that's how I, I look at things. I try, uh, in terms, when I talk about social issues, you know, it seems like everybody else says it's all black and white. W.E.B. Du Bois, he said that the biggest problem in America is the color line. And still, 2012 later, we're still talking about the color line. There's still, um, you know, there's self-segregation. There's segregation when it comes to housing and, um, you know, other other issues that we have to deal with, too. So, uh, you know, the privilege is, I think we have to understand privilege uh, to be sort of, um, you know, I, I think you have to, it, there is white privilege, but I think that some folks have benefited more from their white privilege, like Mayor Fisher or the police officers or uh, uh, the rich white people. I think the rich white people have benefited from, you know, white privilege way more than the homeless man or, say, Bradley Manning. Bradley Manning is a white male who's a hero who uh, history will vindicate, just like they did Muhammad Ali in the Vietnam era, as a hero. 
Bradley Manning is now being tortured here in America, and they're trying to secretly convict him without anybody knowing what's going on. So being a white male doesn't excuse anything. And in fact, if you're a hero, it can um, it doesn't help you. You know, uh, it doesn't help a hero if you, that you're a white male. So white being a white male doesn't trump over everything. Um, so, so you know, like I said, I just think that it's important to understand. Uh, when it comes to privilege and just like discrimination, you can discriminate against fat people and you can discriminate against ugly people. And so I think all these uh, different indicators and ideas and identities uh, intersect in lots of complicated ways. It's good to talk about and it's good to understand. Um, but I, but like a, I guess I think both black and white people are racist. I think everybody sees the color line. I think everybody sees white, black, brown, maybe Mexican. I don't know if that's how they say it. Um, but if you're just looking at colors, it just seems like it's black, white, and brown. That's all you got. And when it comes to cultures, the DNA test that the Ancestry.com had was Chinese culture, European culture, African culture, and Amer uh, Native American culture. So I think that those four groups are, you know, there's there's some use to to grouping folks. Um, you know, just just in terms of biology, there might be some medicines or some diseases that tend to attack one group over another, or regions. I think that's important too. So more thoughts. Um, let's see. So um, somebody had also told me that I was like, well, there's a difference between somebody that is a big white supremacist and somebody that has a black friend, and they immediately denied that, and I was like, oh, that's that's crazy, because like a lot of people say, well, if you got a black friend, well then you're clearly not raised racist if you got a black friend. Well, yeah, yeah, I think that's that's true. I think that's uh, that's saying something. It's not saying that you're not a racist, but it is saying that you're uh, you know willing to be friends with a black person. So compare that person to somebody that just says the N word all the time and brag about how mean they are to black people and just be, have this all this hate and this rage, uh, sort of like some of my cousins had. Now, if you have you know something like that. And you have that person who's got all this rage versus somebody that has a black friend. I think that's the, the person who's got a black friend is a uh, a better you know Caucasian, a better person, a better human being, frankly, uh, than than the the Confederate Cluxer. So it, it, I'm not it, it, I'm not sure what the point that he was trying to make, but I guess he was trying to say that everybody's got this little bit of racism in them, and we got to smash it somehow. I suggested interracial marriage. I was like, do, you know, is that how you do it? And he was like, no, that wouldn't do it either. And I was like, I don't know. And I watched uh, Guess Who with uh, Bernie Mac and Aston Kutcher, and he was like, I have a black girlfriend. You know, I have a black fiance. How can I be racist? How can you call me racist? I'm with you know, I'm going to marry a black woman for the rest of my life. So. How can, you know, you consider me racist? Um, so, you know, some of our cousins were racist. Uh, forget that they had brown skin. You know, just forget about that part. They had brown skin and they were racist. Well, don't forget about it. Actually, I think that's kind of an important part. My, I got a theory. And they went to school and they were getting some shit about their brown skin. Some I probably call them Mexican or something. So they it was like, no, I'm against Mexicans, I uh, hate Mexicans, and that way they were never mischaracterized ever again. And, well, Ellis Presley had a German father, and he's got like an olive color, you know, a darkness to his skin. And I think a lot of Germans have like a, a, a more darker complexion to their skin. So it's, uh, I also have 11% African uh, blood in me, so I'm not sure if that comes from my mother or father, and neither one of them have sought to try to figure that one out. Um, but 11% African came from somewhere. So, you know, the fact that they got brown skin, I think might have been why they're racist, but it also is because it also shows that racists end up hating themselves. And they hate everybody that has any, you know, uh, uh, anybody that's not white, you know, they love being white, which they aren't. Um, they, they end up hating themselves because they have brown skin. So the, uh, when it comes to being white, when somebody, the only people that I know who's like, you know what, I'm white, and that means something, that are generally white supremacists. Those are the only people that I hear that, like, declare their whiteness, like it means something, like it's like something to be proud of, some, like, badge of, uh, of accomplishment. And frankly, like, what, you know, even, like, being a man or, you know, my, my skin complexion or anything, like, physical features like that, how can you be proud? Like, how can I be proud of being... You know, I don't know, just a, a Covington, a Covingtonian. Yeah, you know, Covington is a, a good city and all, 
Uh, but I was born there. It's not like I accomplished it. It's not like I accomplished becoming a man. It's not like I accomplished uh, being, you know, having pale skin. That's not an accomplishment. So for anybody to be proud of being white, that's that's usually just a, a white supremacist, neo-Nazi, skinhead, clucks or bigot piece of shit.